Whenever things get hairy around the world, it is our diplomats that we trust to get stuck in and sort things out. But effective diplomacy requires serious skills, not least foreign language skills. Today, we gathered around a thousand people from different countries. Today, we are together to work together. In the U.S., diplomats are known as foreign service officers, and their training is very much not for the faint-hearted. There is rigorous language training, an exam that is frankly terrifying, and then they are shipped off to the world's most dangerous places. Are they completely mad? I have news for you. There will be more hardship coming your way. Life is like that. It spares no one. That was Yuri Kim, a Korean American diplomat. When she was only 29, she was working at the U.S. Embassy in China when an accidental bombing led to an angry mob besieging the embassy with all the staff trapped inside. You will not believe what Yuri did to fix the situation, but I will give you a hint. It had something to do with her phenomenal language skills. We will get to that later. But first, let's get back to basics. A diplomat or foreign service officer is someone who is sent to other countries to represent their own country in very important matters. They mostly work at embassies and consulates, moving to new locations every two to three years, mostly. But the job is more than just visas and passports. Diplomats are specialists at talking to world leaders, making negotiations, and helping to make decisions about our country's futures. And of course, this is why languages are so important. As an American diplomat, your most important job, of course, is to protect American citizens abroad. You are on the front line of America's engagement with the world, so no surprise that learning to speak foreign languages is absolutely essential to the job. So what happened with Yuri Kim. Well, she was in China at the time of the Chinese embassy bombing in Belgrade, Serbia. It was her very first assignment, and the U.S. embassy where she worked in China had to deal with violent demonstrations against the U.S. We're talking everybody trapped inside the embassy, rage on the streets. Now, this is the kind of situation where your language skills suddenly have to be kicked into action because you need to know what's going to happen next, right? And what better way to organize a 24-hour watch than to slip in and mix with the angry crowds? You see, Yuri had learned Mandarin. She understood their language. Now she needed to understand the sentiment of the people. So she and her Asian team mixed inconspicuously with the locals and reported on what they were feeling, doing, and saying. It was dangerous, but the intel she got from understanding the language was critical to the work of the U.S. in the aftermath. Yuri Kim now speaks six languages, and what we want to know is how did she learn them and how did she get to choose? We're going to check out the training school for diplomats, but you should know, first of all, that getting in is a challenge. The process of choosing foreign service officers is very, very selective. Candidates must successfully complete a three-part exam, a medical exam and background checks. If you pass these tests, only then can you attend the training program, which includes language lessons. But can you choose your language? Absolutely not. They choose for you. See, just like with the military guys and girls at the DLI, Defense Language Institute, everything is done based on the needs of the service. You go where you're assigned and you learn what you are told to learn, languages included. Of course, if you already have a background in the language that you're assigned, then they will assess your level and put you in a suitable class. So where do they get these amazing language skills? This is FSI, the Foreign Service Institute. It's part of the U.S. Department of State, and it's basically a mini university for diplomat students, all the way out in Arlington, Virginia. 5,000 students arrive annually from the State Department and 40 other government agencies, as well as the military. If you take into account all of the course offerings across the institution, then FSI averages about 200,000 course enrollments each year. Now, students come from all walks of life, though. In Yuri Kim's orientation class, there was a former ski instructor, a nuclear engineer, and a musician. They're training diplomats for some pretty tough roles, so there are many courses that they have to take, but here we're gonna stay focused on the language courses. There's a huge selection of languages with approximately 60 languages being taught at any given time. Enrollments may be anywhere between 8 to 44 weeks, depending on the difficulty of the language and the student's objective. Now, the languages range from easy to extremely difficult languages, and I will tell you what counts as an easy or difficult language in just a second. And languages are taught here to varying degrees, from survival to advanced language skills. It's perfectly fine to start off with just English, but students have to become fluent in at least one foreign language within the first five years. Now, okay, I know that I used the F word there, fluent, but I don't use it lightly. Diplomats really do have to be fluent because of the way that they will actually be using the language. In fact, to level up to the highest ranks, they must master a minimum of two languages, but most of them, you see, they don't stop there and can speak three or more with at least some proficiency. Like 
Yuri Kim. She learned Japanese here at FSI, but she can speak English, Korean, Mandarin, Japanese, Turkish, and some Albanian. I have heard of diplomats who can speak 15 or more languages. Yuri could even use her native language when she had to develop expertise on the North Korean nuclear program. Yes. That. Anyway, the school addresses all aspects of language training. There is classroom instruction, there's distance learning, there's learning consultation services, and then the test, which is no joke, but we will get to that later. It would be nice to think that the world of diplomacy was all very predictable, but of course it is nothing of the sort. And so the whole apparatus has a certain amount of flexibility built in. For example, sometimes a diplomat will be reassigned in their role and suddenly have to start operating in a different major dialect of a language that they already know, moving from Egypt to Saudi Arabia, for example, or Lisbon to Rio. And this is all taken care of with special transition courses that are six to eight weeks long, far shorter than the main language courses, but thorough enough to orientate you to a new dialect, which, like the examples I just gave, can be quite different from one another. There is more, though. Sometimes there is an urgent need for an officer to learn a very specific language at a time when no courses are scheduled. Swahili, Vietnamese, whatever it may be. In this case, they will send you to a special civilian language school, or a school called DLS, for some customized instruction. But you'll still get tested back at FSI, so there's no escaping that one. And yes, there is that scary test. We will get to that, but I promised you a peek into the online language courses and how even you can do them at home. So let's see. So as promised, here is a quick look at how the FSI rates language difficulty and how long they think you will need to learn each language. If you are learning another language right now, it's quite fun to locate that language in this list and see just what you are up against, at least according to the FSI. Now, some of these languages really are quite hard, but one thing that's not quite so hard is liking this video and subscribing to the channel. Even if you don't become a diplomat, you can still do this and turn on notifications too if you'd like to hear about more videos just like this. Now, in addition to languages, students are also taught about the traditions and culture of the countries where they will be starting out their service. And it seems like the teachers do a pretty good job. I think the training here is very practical. We are given hands-on exercises and role plays about how to respond to a certain issue. We dive deep into the issues that we could encounter. We read a lot of background information that also, I think it's very comprehensive. The vast majority of the teachers are native speakers and they are very supportive on your journey. They're good at teaching students not only languages but also the culture of their own homeland and it's really not hard to see how important cultural literacy is to a job like diplomacy. So instructors are really keen to share celebratory traditions with their students, Ramadan, Chinese New Year, etc. If there's a national holiday, it is celebrated. So they're really at pains to emphasize the cultural aspect of the languages being taught. And they say that the corridors of FSI can get pretty colorful at times, but how much fun is it actually? In a nutshell, studying with FSI includes early morning classes, self-study and distance learning courses. You're also expected to use and develop language skills on your own after the course. But it begins easy enough. There are 25 hours of classroom instruction a week or 24 to 44 weeks. That's basically five hours a day. They follow a pedagogical framework with a good balance of different skills. And it goes a little bit like this. Roughly a quarter of their time is spent on input, both in class and self-study. So this is listening and reading, where the focus is just on understanding the message. Then another quarter of their time is for output, speaking and writing, again, with a focus on the message. So sounds pretty good so far. The next quarter is for working on fluency. And this basically means reaching the point where a language task is so easy that it's done just automatically. For example, introducing yourself. If you can do that without thinking, it's a good sign. And then lastly, the last quarter, the final quarter that we haven't talked about yet is on language mechanics. So that's your grammar, vocabulary, and pronunciation. Now you're giving deliberate attention to the use of language at this point, so constructing meaning. With easier languages, you can do a lot of the learning on your own, as you will see. But if you're doing a language with a different script, which is gonna be super challenging, you'll probably train for a year at FSI and then spend a second year in the new country learning through immersion, totaling 88 weeks of training. For example, they have centers in Tunisia, Cairo, and Beirut, where you can give your Arabic full ninja training. So it is pretty organized and pretty thorough. Yuri Kim, for example, took her Chinese classes when she was already on the job in Beijing. So there is an element of flexibility in the way the training is rolled out at FSI. And later in the video, I'm gonna tell you some language resources that FSI actually makes available 
online for free because you might want to get into that yourself. Or save it for a rainy day or something. Now, are you at all envious of the training that these diplomats get? I know I am too. And so one of the things that I do personally to mimic this immersion experience is to have what I call a no English rule when I watch TV. So it's really simple. I simply stop watching all TV in English and I only watch TV in the language I'm learning instead. It is really simple and improves your listening skills fast. But there is a problem because if you try and watch TV from say France or Spain, you'll soon find out that TV from that country is blocked if you're trying to access it from outside the country. So to get around this, I use what is called a VPN. Specifically, I use a company called NordVPN who are very kindly sponsoring this video right here. Now a VPN is a nifty piece of software that sits on your computer or on your phone. And when you activate it, it teleports your internet connection to any country that you choose. So let's say that you choose France. Well, you can now go to the TF Ars station, for example, and stream TV, movies, the news right there on your computer, just as if you were in France. It works perfectly because you can totally binge on TV and feel great about it because you're learning a ton in the language. Now, NordVPN lets you connect to 60 countries and it gets you the fastest speeds of all VPNs on the major platforms, which means your connection doesn't slow down when you're streaming. But not only that, it is genuinely affordable too. For example, if you take out a two year subscription, it is literally pennies a day. Here is the link here on the screen. So head over there if you'd like to sign up and give the no English rule a run for its money. It really is a no brainer if you're learning another language to have a VPN, partly for the immersion that you get, but also for the motivation too. So me, for example, every Sunday morning, I connect to Japan and I watch a couple of hours of NHK, the local TV station there live. And I feel like I'm in Japan. I absolutely love it. So head over to nordvpn.com forward slash Ollie Richards to sign up. There's a link in the description down below as well. Grab that two year plan that I mentioned. Now, where were we? Now there's something about FSI that is very different to the kind of training that you would get with the military or the Mormons, for example, which I will link to in the description, by the way, for those videos, they're very interesting. I have a whole playlist on this channel, in fact, where you can hear about how these different groups learn languages. Anyway, in my research about FSI, I was really left with the impression that you were expected to be quite mature and proactive in your own journey. I'll explain. FSI tries to meet students where they are in terms of their learning trajectory. So the language instructors really work with you to make sure that you're practicing in ways that will really prepare you for your assignments based on where you already are with your languages. It's very much not a kind of lockstep mass training system that they're running here. Everyone gets involved and has a say in their own learning path. So one group might have a consistent agenda each day and another group might decide to vary activities each day depending on whatever they want to do. And they don't have to argue about it either and you'll see why in just a moment. Basically each class has a roadmap of where they need to be at predetermined points in their language training and the instructors then create lesson plans based on what they need. Apparently they're very responsive to student needs every step of the way which is fantastic like having a private tutor to yourself. So I'm curious what you think so far about the training here. Leave me a comment and let me know if this is something that you would like to do yourself. One cool aspect of these classes is that they are very small. They're tiny. They really have more than four students per teacher, five maximum, so you get proper attention. There is no need for the naughty corner, no need to fight over teacher time. In fact, there's also some one-on-one -on -one time with instructors each week too, so that you can address anything that may be bothering you, or maybe just have a chat about your progress or the weather, who knows. So what lessons do they actually do? Well, it depends. On any given day, students will engage with their language using multiple forms of interaction. It's those four quarters that we spoke about before. But it's at least five hours a day working on conversation, interview techniques, reading and presentations, and lots of other skill building activities. So for example, you might have a topical debate with another class or do a fun vocabulary quiz or carry out mock visa interviews. Sometimes a comprehension exercise. It might mean that you just get to quietly read a book of your choice in the language that you're learning, of course. And that is, of course, my favorite part because I know that reading works. It's the reason why I write all of these books. FSI, seen these yet? And by the way, on the topic of reading, here at Story Learning, we teach languages entirely through the power of stories, which is probably very different to the way you learn at FSI and how you learned at school too, but it works really well for people who enjoy learning by themselves, self-study, that kind of thing. And if you're interested in seeing how my story learning method works, I've put together something that is really cool for you. It is a free story learning kit that shows you how you can harness the power of stories to learn a new language. It's got a bunch of goodies inside, masterclasses, downloads, things you can print out and fill in, and it's all completely free too, so check it out. There's a link down below in the description. Anyway, back to FSI. In the classroom, during the first few weeks, you will likely hear some English spoken in class, but after the initial instruction, almost all classroom time is done in the new language, which is pretty standard for all of the bootcamp type programs that I have looked at in this series. 
Another thing that FSI students get to access is language laboratories with some cool multimedia technology. There are vocabulary programs, videos, you can even record yourself and compare the way you sound against native speakers with audio files, which is pretty good ear and speaking training. But here's a question. If you're going to be posted overseas, but you're not single and your family is going to come with you, well, how on earth are they going to learn the language? I mean, your spouse and kids have to survive too, right? Well, it turns out that they are taken care of as well. And I will tell you how in just a little bit. Now, I promised you a peek inside the online language courses and how even you can do this at home. So let's see. FAST stands for Familiarization and Short-Term Training, F-A-S-T. And these are extremely popular and quick FSI language courses designed for when you don't have the time for the whole shebang. They are in the public domain, so diplomats anywhere can access them, but so can you. Now, at the moment, these courses are used for what's called eligible family members. That means anyone who goes with a foreign service officer to their overseas post. So that could be your wife, your husband, your kids. What you get is a bunch of downloadable MP3 files and PDFs as well. And they teach very kind of practical language, the stuff that you'd use in everyday situations, including a decent introduction to the culture as well. Now the goal is to accomplish various tasks, taking a very experiential approach. So you'll learn things like how to get through customs at the airport, hotel reservation, ordering food, you know, practical things like that. And the best part is that it's quite collaborative. So you can practice dialogue scenarios, for example. And if you do it with an instructor, then you know, their role is to play the native speaker, then you respond. Let's take a listen. Le chiamo un tassi, signora? Sì, si, grazie. Mi chiami un tassi, per favore. And so this is the FSI method. You get a lot of phrases, a lot of variations, different responses you can use, and endless, endless, endless drills. I mean, it's very thorough, I have to say, albeit very different to how I personally learn and teach languages. It's just relentlessly focused on practical day-to-day -day language, which is probably what you want if you need to navigate life in a foreign country in a hurry. Now, back to FSI itself. Homework? Oh yes, very much so. FSI students get grammar homework each and every day, which gives them a chance to review what they've been learning in class. Remember, you are treated like an adult here, so it's up to you to put in the essential self-study hours, and that's at least three hours a day of self-study, by the way. No mean feat. Teachers are usually available for questions, and students, well, they like to sit together and chat about their courses too. But something big and monstrous is still coming, and you know what it is, it's the exams. You have to pass an exam before getting posted overseas, and it is not easy. This test measures your ability in some very challenging subjects to match the kind of situations you will be in on the job. Now, as we've learned from Yuri Kim earlier, this is serious business. You probably know all about written exams. You've probably survived a few yourself, right? But that was the easy part. The speaking exam, well, are you ready for this? You'll be asked to talk at length in your new language about an important or complex topic. So it could be the environment, the political system of the United States, education, the military, and that's not all. You also have to interview a native speaker in the language and then translate it into English. And imagine doing this when the interviewee is also your examiner. You really need nerves of steel for this kind of interview, but you're not done yet because there is still the reading exam and you can pretty much guess what that is all about. So in the end, you're going to be thoroughly tested in reading, writing and speaking and translating the new language. Definitely a thorough exam and nowhere to hide. Now, are you ready for this? The score you have to achieve depends on the language, as well as the job that you will be sent to do. But it roughly equates to a C1 level of fluency, which is pretty high because it's the highest you can go to before C2, which even native speakers cannot test in at from time to time because of how articulate and educated you need to be to operate at that level. I mean, do you have, for example, the English vocabulary you need to negotiate a trade deal or discuss supply chain issues during a pandemic, for example? Probably not on the tip of your tongue. But this language exam is meant to model what diplomats might have to do overseas in their target language. Bottom line is, can you handle most formal and informal conversation? Can you read international news and professional reports with ease? I mean, it's going to be fun if you're completely mad and this is your thing. Of course, the perception of whether the exam is challenging is highly subjective and each student does have a unique experience. Okay, so how much time do you get all together? Well, for easier languages, Spanish, French, Dutch, etc., you get about four months. German is a bit longer, and for Russian, you get even more time. For languages like Korean, Arabic, and Japanese, well, they give you a year or more. All in all, FSI does a lot to prepare you, not only for the test, but to navigate daily life in that language. But they do say, generally, that if you take the whole thing seriously, really engage in the class sessions, actively participate, well, you will be just fine on the test. And like anything, I guess, how much you learn is really up to you. Some students are even given the opportunity to take a little immersion trip, which sounds very cool. 
Meeting foreigners is, of course, fun, but let's face it, being a diplomat does not just mean standing around chatting about the weather. Although if you live here where I do in the south of England, it is pretty much essential knowledge. Being a diplomat means conducting negotiations and fine-tuning your skills in the art of persuasion. And there is more because it's one thing passing an exam in the language you've just learned. It's quite another to have the composure and wherewithal to use that language effectively when bombs are going off all around you. Back to Yuri Kim, who worked in Baghdad for a year when bombs going off was a regular occurrence. She said, when we got a warning that a mortar was coming in, we would climb under the bed or go into the bathtub to maximize the chances of survival. Wanna hear her advice? I hope you choose to get back up no matter how many times life knocks you down. You will get bruised along the way. But every time you choose to get back up, you will get back up stronger and wiser than before. There is ongoing support out in the field though, including a network of language field schools and regional programs in the Middle East, North Africa, and Asia. I mean, it's pretty intense, right? But the pressure doesn't stop just because you landed a job. There is also this system called tenure, which is basically a status you get at some point after your first overseas tour. Before this, you're on a sort of language probation, and to get off probation, well, you have to test in at a certain level, and if you can't do it, well, you're out of the foreign service. Sounds kind of harsh, but it does make sense, because if you can't speak the language, well, then you're not going to be able to do your job. And no one understands this better than the recruits across the pond in the French Foreign Legion. Now, these guys have to learn French. They have to do it fast. Their discipline is legendary, and you should click on this video and watch it right now.